welcome to episode two of the Garden Revival BBQ. BBQ, as you all know, stands for big burning questions. We all have them and we all need them answered sometimes. I am your host, IG, the server is Illegal Guardian, and co-hosting with me is my tech support and my moral support, Space Butler. Our panel today is ecologist and plant lover, Passiflora, and professional gardener, Zappy Snaps. Hello, guys. Hey. Hey there. Hey. <laughs> so, how is everybody dealing with winter? I'm cold stratifying a ton of seeds and buying more plants. I was going to say I read that you got some, am I pronouncing this right, Mitagena speciosa to germinate? I'm probably butchering that really bad. I, I don't know how to pronounce it. Pro- I say Mitragena speciosa too, so. I, it's either that or Mitragena. Yeah. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And why was that such a big deal, Passy? Well, apparently online, people always talk about them being a plant that the seeds, most of them don't germinate regardless, and that even fewer of them will not germinate once they, you know, have been off of the tree for a couple days, weeks, or, you know, they uh-huh. say if you can get it to germinate after even a couple months, it's you're incredibly lucky. And mm-hmm. meanwhile, I, I got... A bunch of seeds to germinate that are over two years old. So that's incredible. I did. Congratulations. Sure. Yeah, awesome. I did. What about you, Zapti? What have you been up to? I have been really enjoying my indoor garden with my passion fruit and eating ripe passion fruit in Washington State in January. Is you know that's an experience. That's pretty fun. And you know, I so also cool have that things. you can grow them indoors. That's just I still can't wrap my mind around that. Yeah, I saw that picture yeah. on Instagram. Looks amazing. Right. It it's a lot of fun, and I definitely don't think it's a plant that most people would have indoors because you know mine is currently growing from the floor to the ceiling and is at least <laughs> six feet wide. Um, and then I've also grown tomatoes and basil and cilantro and green onions indoors and it's finally like it's finally stopped raining enough that I can actually work outside which is really exciting for me because as a gardener I don't have a lot of time during the growing season to tend my own garden so I'm trying to set it up this year so that if I don't have time to water or weed It'll be fine. I can just go out there to pick, you know, vegetables and fruits once they're ready. So I take it your soil isn't frozen? It didn't even freeze last night, right? It, we're in the middle of January. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it's, I mean, it's still in the, these, um, sometimes That's bopping nice up to 50, but yeah, it's been unseasoned. Warm. <laughs> um, That's nice. I'm not even yeah, going to ask Cassie about his soil because that's 100% frozen. All frozen. <laughs> it's so frozen. <laughs> yeah, it just makes me worried because, like, last year it was kind of like this in January, too. And then in the summer we had, like, a massive heat wave for here, which I realized for other people, 110 degrees is, like, normal. But for here it was, like, literally record-breaking, literally hotter than I had seen it in my, like, good 10 degrees. Um, so okay. it's making me worry that it'll be in this year. So I guess we'll see. Well, hopefully it'll be a little more gentle on you. I hope so. You told me today that you started a TikTok. Is that because you're incredibly bored? Yeah, yeah. If you if you were to go look at my first few videos, like last year in December, I was like, I'm so I make and I like say the the TikTok, and then I did the same thing this year, but then I kept making videos. <laughs> but yeah, it was like okay, I'm stuck inside. There's nothing to do. I need something to do. <laughs> so are they all yeah. garden related? Uh they are almost all garden or house plant related. Nice. Um, yeah, yeah, pretty much. I th- we'll I have to share about, that like... with our audience. Sure, can't wait to see. <laughs> I'm yeah I sorry what I was gonna see if Passy maybe is into TikTok absolutely not 
I, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know what it is about it. I just, I, I just can't, I don't know why. I just don't really like watching, I guess, like videos in general. And then TikTok, it gets its algorithm just hates me. And oh. it never was able oh. to like give me like useful or, or nice videos I enjoyed watching. So I don't oh, really yeah. have it. But my girlfriend has TikTok, and so she just sends me all the cute animal videos that she likes, and you know, I'll just inevitably like them too. So, yeah, you can't help it. I mean, <laughs> yeah. you know, you're a human. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's get to the question, Space Butler. What's on the list? What is first? All right, so uh, Matanshu says, um, or asks, I should say, uh, oil doesn't mix in the water, so somebody told me to add shampoo to it. Will shampoo cause any harm? So I assume this is relating to some kind of um, oil, like uh, like neem oil or, or something that they would apply to their plants. Um, so what I would say is I wouldn't use shampoo. <laughs> um, and perhaps I said that with a bit too much judgment in my voice. But what people do use is a little bit of soap, like just a little bit of dish soap and um that's fine you're using a small enough amount it should be fine you know it's widely recommended and used so i wouldn't worry about it so long as you're using soap i feel i feel like you would probably want to stick to a more simple one like but i don't know i i guess i just have this idea that shampoos have more weird stuff in them than soap does so just stick with the more simple things, but. Would you recommend Castile soap over something that has SLS in it, or what are the other things? Maybe glycerin is a more I... gentle thing? <laughs> I mean, yeah, Castile's trope would be fine. Um, I I don't tend to worry too much about other things, but if that's something that someone uh, does have concerns about or knows that they have issues with, yeah, just pick one that doesn't have those. Um, I do know people sometimes, I don't want to say brand names, right? But I keep hearing the the dish soaps that you use in your kitchen mentioned a lot. <laughs> so. All right. Uh, so we have another question from Drifty. Um, what are the best ways to enjoy growing gardens indoors while also preventing your pets from eating your plant babies, especially the <laughs> plants that will uh, make pets sick? So I think this is a, a general concern that a lot of people have. They have indoor plants and they have indoor animals. And what's the best way to separate these two? I... In my experience, it helps to have a lazy cat. Um, but then my roommate got a, well, housemate got a cat, and her cat was not lazy. So I had to move my plants up higher. I moved a lot of my plants to a different room that the cat did not have access to. And I kind of made one of my shelving units, I kind of made, uh, made it so it had walls so the cat just couldn't get to the plants because she really decided that she really wanted to eat the spider plants. Um, it's like, that that's not a good choice for you. Please stop. Um, and I see people buying those Ikea glassed-in cabinets, so there it goes. Uh, you know, going and getting one of those or finding one <laughs> used. Just creating a barrier is, is the best in my experience because um, I know people Eat will try... Pets. Cage your plants, right? No, cage, cage the plants. <laughs> uh, no, I, I definitely meant cage the plants. <laughs> I feel like you would have a rather unhappy cat otherwise. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because, like, I've heard of people using nasty tasting or nasty smelling sprays, but A, you're going to be smelling, and B, they just don't really seem to work for really persistent animals. All right. Uh, we have a question here uh, from uh, Sato. 
how do I identify and or verify quality bonsai tools? Price tag. <laughs> More expensive is usually better. I suppose that works with a lot of things. Yeah, un unfortunately. Yeah, I... oh, sorry. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, I, I don't have too, too much bonsai experience, so I probably wouldn't be the best person to answer this. Right. And I was going to say, I have no <laughs> bonsai experience, but I do have experience with a lot of tools. And one of the things that I think helps is actually picking up the tool and testing it out and, you know, feeling its heft. If it's something that cuts, you know, how well does it move? through its whole range of motion, like test it out. Cause honestly, I often do think uh, price is pretty predictive, but my favorite pair of clippers is actually like a quarter of the cost of the other clippers and they just are workhorses and work really well. So test them out if possible. Cool about this. And that's exactly the advice he gave, which is hard to do when you're shopping on Amazon. <laughs> yeah, no, for real. I think another good piece of advice, well, if, if I'm going to pat myself on the back for giving good advice here, um, would be to just take really good care of all your tools and they will work well. You got to oh, yeah. you gotta sharpen them. You got to clean them. You got to not leave them sitting in a wet spot. So, you're making me feel really guilty right now, just so you know. Oh, oh I'm telling you what you should be doing, not what I'm doing. <laughs> What's next, yeah, you, Space Butler? You can, get, you can get a lot of rust on tools very fast if you leave them outside. Yeah, Definitely well, true. Space Butler is my yeah. cleaner, if you know what I mean. And I don't mean anything by it. He just cleans my tools. I, yeah, I take care of, you know... <laughs> If there's an individual that that is causing an issue, yeah, that kind of cleaner. But we don't um, talk about it. Next. No, that's for that's for a different uh, <laughs> podcast. Uh, so uh, cleanser says I've got tiny tomatoes and open them to take out the seeds. Should I just let them dry out, or is there something else I should do? So, so how to plant tomato seeds? So the classic recommendation is to ferment your tomato seeds because it will increase the germination rate when you then go to plant them later. Um, and I used to do that a lot more than I do now because one year I was like, I don't have time for this. I'm just going to put them on a piece of paper and let them dry out and see what happens. And I still got a 75% germination rate, which to me, if you're willing to thin, and I know some people feel horrible about thinning seedlings, um, but if you're willing to thin, you can just sow extra and then, if you know, remove the extra that uh, show up or, you know, transplant them out and give them to someone else if you feel bad about it. Um, but yeah, Take typically me. you let them ferment in a glass jar and they get all moldy and goopy and then you pour that stuff out yeah. and you have clean seeds, which is nice. Um, Interesting. Yeah, but at this point I just smear them on a piece of paper and dry it out and then you know, fold it up and label it and say, well, this mm -hmm. is this variety from this year. I do the you same know? thing too. I just I just smear them on paper towel and I let it dry and I've never had it <laughs> with germination rates, so I mean I've heard of people just plant a slice and it works. At least a few yeah, of the seeds you'll know, take and that's all you need. That will work just fine, but then you're planting the whole tomato slice and you could just eat the tomato slice and plant the seeds. Like <laughs> sorry, I mean just a few too many Excellent point. Bitty. Ah, like they'll they'll cut a whole tomato in half and put the whole tomato in a pot and I'm like, but you could eat the tomato. <laughs> or you could just leave a few tomatoes hanging on your plants over winter and somehow they plant themselves. They just fall to the ground somehow. and the seeds germinate. Yeah. That's what Bob's does. 
I think Bubs must be in a warmer climate or a warmer summer no, anyway. Cause... She's actually in zone five, I believe. And their winter oh, last well. year went down to negative 30 something Fahrenheit. And she still had that some volunteer tomatoes horrible. this year. That ripened all the way? Because all have cherries ripen, so. but like anything bigger than a cherry <laughs> does not ripen on its own here. Oh, huh. We'll have to talk to Bob's about that. <laughs> so, a Xenogerm asks. Are all barks made equal when using in container soil? I watched a video that said bark mulch is different than wood mulch. The short answer is there is a difference. Um, there's like one or two kinds that are more resistant to breaking down in the soil mix, I believe is what I found. Um, and yeah, wood chips are completely different uh, than bark. Um, wood chips are really. Uh, best used as a mulch because they do break down and as they break down if you mix them into your soil they're going to pull nitrogen from the soil that's why you leave them as a mulch because then they pull the nitrogen from the air um so are there different uh so different trees uh they take the bark from different trees and it has different properties in the soil yeah exactly like some trees bark is more resinous and more resistant to breaking down and you want the most resinous and resistant to breaking down, I believe. I think, it's funny, I think I recall that they said for the East Coast you want to look for cypress bark, I think, and over here, oh gosh. The bark is something you would be using for orchids, maybe? Yeah. Well, and, and other can, epithetic things. And you can mix that in into potting mix to help is it with aeration? And compaction. Um, and I, compaction. I actually yeah. used it for uh, a couple of rainforest trees. And it, it just keeps the soil kind of like looser overall. Yeah. Okay. So it looks like ground... Google, right? Der. Uh, ground coastal redwood or fir or a kind of tree fern fiber. That's interesting. Yeah, because as a person who works outside in gardens, I go to the yard uh the landscaper supply store and they have these huge piles of bark and i'm like can i just get some of that and and use that <laughs> and i think i can if it's dug fur nice oh yeah if, if you have a local supply then i guess ask the people in your area yeah okay uh colin show you Lovers asks about dormancy tips for winter succulents or cacti or houseplants. How to how to deal with, uh, or is this? Uh, I don't know. Is this how to make them dormant or uh, how to cope with them being dormant? Well, um, to cope with them being dormant, you're going to want to water less and fertilize less and just keep an eye on them in general um but do you want them to go them... dormant uh with some yes because it's not a super strong dormancy like you'll see in like daffodils where it just completely dies down to the bowl but they just like have a pause and you want them to do that because then that triggers their blooming in a lot of succulent species um so for Christmas cactuses, everyone knows with Christmas and Thanksgiving cactuses, um, their bloom period is triggered because they get less light or because they're exposed to colder temperatures. So depending on what you're trying to get to go dormant, you're going to want to look up that specific thing and find out what temperature range or what light duration or darkness duration is what mm -hmm. they need to trigger that dormancy period. Will uh, will indoor, like house plants and succulents and that sort of thing have dormancy effects from the quality of sunlight that you get, uh, even though the 
the house that you're you're keeping them in and is still fairly warm yeah so again depending on the species um like christmas cactus they can do either but like if you're not supplementing the light um here at least maybe if you're closer to the equator there's not a noticeable difference but here at least they're getting way less light and they're getting less light both in the intensity of that light but also in the duration of that like it's going to be dark for you know i don't know a really long time <laughs> 16 hours a day right of darkness and so those plants that are sensitive to photoperiod period or how long they are in darkness are going to react to that unless you mm -hmm. have a light or forget your laundry room light on for a really long time <laughs> you sound, it sounds like you're uh, speaking from experience there yeah so so the thing is is with some of them even one day of not getting the amount of darkness they need is enough to delay it so my christmas cactus is blooming now because one night i didn't catch it and my housemate left the laundry room light on oh, all night that is very sensitive yep yep it's really yeah yeah you know some people Amazing. even go so far as stuffing them in a closet every day to make sure like they take it into the closet and take it out of the closet every day just to make sure it has the right photo period that is dedication <laughs> Yeah, that's way more dedicated than I am. I'm like, okay, so it's in January. That's fine. And there Cassie, are do you uh, do do you have uh, a lot of issues with this? Uh, somewhat. I mean, like there are there are a lot of plants up here where they have they go into a winter dormancy and it, based on not just like you know light but also temperature and night length but then also co2 concentrations in the air and with that one it's because as the northern hemisphere goes closer into winter globally you see co2 increasing and then that actually can trigger these plants to also go into a dormancy it's like that for a lot of different kind of pine trees and whatnot amazing Oh. Yeah, and, and so for that, I mean, there's really nothing a person can do to control that aside from, like, breathing around their plant more <laughs> if you had a potted pine plant. So that's a little tricky, and unfortunately, I am the kind of person who was actually, sh like, shuffling around plants into, like, the shed and whatnot to oh. give them the full, like, you know, 12 or 14 hours of pure night, no matter what, because for some plants, they are very sensitive with that. But then there are other plants, like I have a bunch of butterwort plants, and they're supposed to go into a dormancy, apparently, and I've had them for five or six years, and I've never done oh, that. Wow. And they're alive, and they're kicking, they grow like crazy, and they've not once shown any issues, so, yeah. Wow. Huh. Okay. Um, hypersphere asks what plants can you use on a field of clay to make it more soily without the use of fertilizer over five to ten years so uh what uh what's good for for growing for growing your your soil quality over the long term i guess so i've actually done this and i want to say i'm really glad that they put that time frame because the most important part of the transformation is patience um and so what i've found really useful is using a lot of mulch and you know pretty nutritive mulch like i'm not putting bark down i'm putting wood chips down and putting straw down and putting putting down moldy hay that you can get for free from farmers where the hay got rained on uh fall leaves that sort and then what i'll also do is in the springtime i will plant potatoes because potatoes are great because they will oh, put up potatoes. with a lot right so you put <laughs> potatoes on the ground and you bury them under a foot of hay and they're fine they come up right through and then all you have to do to harvest them is pull the hay off of them it's great um and then the other thing i've done is just sow a mix of cover crops and over time that will make a pretty big difference so i used scarlet clover and daikon radish in a kind of mix 
And so I've been here five years now. Um, and when I first got here, my soil in the front of the yard was just this tannish, dead looking clay with like a quarter inch of organic matter at the top. And I was out there digging earlier because I wanted to see how it looked. And I could not find a spot that looked bad anymore. The organic wow. matter layer is now like five to six inches deep. And Amazing. since this was like really bad soil and me being super hands off because for most of this time, you know, I was a teacher and really over. <laughs> so it did not get a lot of attention. Right. So through patience, time and a lot of mulch, you really can make a huge difference. Awesome. That so sounds good to me. Uh, let let nature do the work for you. Yeah. If you have the patience. Which I'm not sure I do. <laughs> That's why the potatoes is a virtue. come in. <laughs> I, I want flowers. Potatoes. And I want them now. Sure. Aw. <laughs> Uh, so uh, here's a um, here's a question that won't uh, that I'm sure everybody can agree on. Uh, Hypersphere asks, "What's your favorite color of plant?" There's only one Purple. right answer, by the way. Uh, it's oh. green. <laughs> I know this one. Yeah. <laughs> Are you guys thinking, is this hard? <laughs> no, no, purple is my favorite. Um, I don't, you know, obviously I like plants that I eat, but if I can't eat it, I want it to be really neat. And I just, you know, I look around my plant room and I've got like the purpley succulents, I've got the purpley tratoscantias, and it's like, it's just such a good color on a plant, really. I, I do like purple, and I like purple foliage a lot. I prefer purple foliage to red foliage. It, oh, it might yeah. be a minor difference, but I don't know, like the purple. I think it's a pretty big difference, and I feel like I probably am a little biased against red foliage, because around here, everyone planted those red-leaved ornamental plums, and I just get so tired oh, of seeing that particular shade that of happen. red. I'm just like, come on. Yeah, I'm kind of allergic to plants that I see in, like, parking <laughs> strips. Just yeah. can't. It's just... They're just everywhere. <sighs> they just, like, suck the fun out of those plants. Oh! <laughs> Sorry! <laughs> But I'm going to go on the record and say I don't have a favorite color and I don't have a favorite color of plants. But I do gravitate to certain colors in the garden. And sure. I think white is an amazing color in the garden because it works with everything. And it just lights up everything and it looks great at night when you wouldn't oh, yeah. see the other colors as much anymore. Yeah. What about you, Passy? I'm, I got a toss up. I really like a lot of the orange flowers. They're like those really vibrant orangish reddish kind of flowers that many different plants have. But for like just the color on a plant, it is really rare, but blue is super cool. Oh, it's actually yeah. like quite a light blue, God, but there's the a blue. bunch of ferns that have like a nice blue foliage, and I love those. Yeah, those are amazing. Yeah, that would be pretty cool. But they are shockingly rare, so or at least it's a rare color in nature in general. Yeah. So, yeah. Zappy, don't you have a, a begonia with kind of shiny blue? Leaves? Yeah, yeah, it's a begonia pavonia. I'm really bad at pronouncing scientific yeah, names, yeah. and it's really shiny and so cool. Yeah, yeah, it's like a prom dress. Yeah, yeah, it's it half and half really crazy. <laughs> There was a recently discovered, I, I say quotey fingers because I think it was like maybe two or three years ago it was, there was a research paper that finally named it, but it's Begonia Metallicolor, and that Ooh. is, apparently it's, it's also super blue and very shiny and like super reflective, like even more than Begonia Pavophonia or whatever the pronunciation is on that one, but it, um, it's it's super hard to get your hands on because after it was kind of discovered, it's just gone. Yeah, 
And it, it was so poached when it was first found. Aww. And so now, if you want to find one, it's Ugh, really so hard. I hate it when that happens. Yeah, it's so sad. Uh, we're going to move on to a less controversial topic. Oh, and okay, uh, okay. good. Let, so, let's relax uh, on this next one. Yeah, so a Hypersphere asks, what do you think about uh, genetic modifications of plants to add nutrients like golden rice? What about Monsanto's use of GMO so that fruit can't grow from seed past uh, one harvest? Easy question. A lot less controversial. <laughs> <laughs> Zappy, do you want to go first with that one? Oh, I was just about to ask you. Um, but sure. So... I think this is the kind of question that you need to have nuance around because I feel like there's a lot of misinformation and a lot of feelings on the matter, of course. And I think there's so much potential for it, like the golden rice and stuff, but there's also the way that the companies treat seeds and GMO stuff as intellectual property and then go sue farmers and that's all messy and ugly, right? <laughs> like mm -hmm. the technology itself has so much potential and could be used for so much good and then choices have been made that are harmful to people and to farmers and you know, you can't, you have to be nuanced here, right? Because it's not, mm -hmm. it's not like, oh, GMOs are evil. It's, or GMOs are good. It's neither of those, right? <laughs> um, and so I think it's really cool what the potential is for. And I also really don't like how Monsanto, for example, uh, treated the seed market in India and that's a really long conversation and I highly encourage people to like research it from reputable sources so yeah I think I'll end there see <laughs> there. Um, I guess for, for my stance on this is I, I really like the technology and I think it has really strong potential and not only has potential, but it's already showing what it's capable of doing. Mm -hmm. Golden rice, for instance, I believe it was either vitamin A. Vitamin A. Mm -hmm. Yeah, vitamin A that was being, it, some genes to produce that were spliced into the rice. Um, and that's super important because turns out globally, vitamin A, there's a huge amount of deficiencies with people's, po like with populations, and that leads to huge health consequences. Yeah. And then on top of the vitamin A, they also spliced in a bunch of genes that make the plant coalesce more. I think it's iron as well as iodine oh. and other things into the rice. So it really makes it extremely healthy over regular, you know, just essentially nutrient free rice basically um because it's more than just carbohydrates then um the big the big pushback against it was definitely the fact that you had this european research institute producing it and then they turned around and they went to you know various farmers throughout other countries and said you should grow this and you know these farmers looked at them and said like we you have no idea you know what i'm growing why i'm growing it or like any of these kind of any of the cultural aspects beside all of these things and mm -hmm. on top of that there was a huge amount of concern over whether or not the genes in the golden rice would be bred into nature and if they would spread mm -hmm. out into other plants which is a completely fair totally reasonable suspicion and concern and that's why i actually kind of like the idea of making it so that certain genetically engineered plants can't produce seed after their first harvest because then that way if there's crossover where there's cross-pollination between you know a farm of genetically engineered plants with pollen from other plants sorry going to other plants in nature they might produce a fruit but then that fruit doesn't keep going it doesn't produce this new line because 
especially with genetic engineering, it is it is a technology that's on the same level of, you know, like, I guess, culture changing and world changing as nuclear power or, you know, inventing the printing press or internet. Like, it is an extremely powerful and useful tool, but it just has to be done really responsibly. And so I think that over time we're going to see hopefully more of it coming out and it is extremely useful because it also allows us to we're not f making artificial nature like we're not really playing god what we're doing is we're taking genes that are already present in other plants and we're putting them into these plants that we want and i do hope though that there's going to be a little bit more government oversight especially internationally simply because you know once these genes in these plants cross over into nature you can't take that back and that's also a huge reason why they are worried about the genetically engineered mosquitoes to stop malaria is because you know you're doing this on a global level and so anything you're doing on a global level you want to make sure that there is no room for error and so you know, hopefully over time we do start incorporating these things more into our farming and more into our food production because it'll make us healthier, but also do it responsibly. It's interesting. GMOs have such a terrible reputation that seed companies that sell to consumers like me, they always advertise that their seeds are non-GMO, even though, of course, they're not GMO. Yeah, <laughs> yeah sell oh, GMO yeah. to us. Yeah, and I mean, you know, to produce, to genetically engineer plants, you know, it, it costs like hundreds of millions or even billions of dollars. And so, yeah, you know, I, I really don't think that someone's like little like, you know, home run seed company is going to be doing any genetic engineering uh -huh. anytime soon. At least I hope not. <laughs> I'm not sure there'd be a profit return on that. Zero. No. Oh, um, <laughs> not for a $3 seed packet. And yeah. there are there is a lot of genetic engineering with plants that's actually really beneficial that doesn't get talked about because people always talk about the the devil in the room, the Monsanto. Mm -hmm. Because you know, University of California, they do a lot of genetic engineering with plants, and what they've been working on is producing a bunch of citrus plants that don't die out to a certain type of fungus that I can't remember the name of. And they do patent it because it is so expensive. But then what they do is they use the money from the royalties on that patent to do more research rather than just like, you know, use it to just pad their pockets. And mm -hmm. so that way, you know, as they make useful things, that can fund them to produce just more useful things. Yeah, and I think that's a really good point because... <laughs> I was talking to my partner. I don't remember what plant it was, but it was a copyrighted plant. And he was like, what? Uh, uh, he's not actually like that. He was like, why are they copywriting this plant? It's like, well, because some university spent a lot of time developing it and breeding it up and they need to support those programs. So <laughs> like a lot of people just have that, you know, instinctual like why why are we copywriting literally planes i was like well because that's part of how they get funded that's mm -hmm. part of how we get really cool things yeah and and there's also like there's there's a lot of success stories especially with genetic engineering for plants that people just don't know because you know it's not as flashy as as like mm -hmm. a big scary thing um like papayas for instance i know I, I like papayas. I hope other people do too. Um, and with papayas, there was a virus that was actually killing mm -hmm. off crops of them globally. And there we were at a point, you know, where it was basically like, unless we can figure out a way to stop this virus, humanity has to say goodbye to the papaya. And so some researchers buckled down and they spliced into the papaya plants the genes from the virus for the virus protein coat to be produced on the outside of the cells of the plant. And the reason why they did that is because viruses usually, not always, but usually don't attach themselves and attack cells where there's already a protein of that virus there. Because, mm -hmm. you know, they just, why would they do that? It's, it's a waste of resources to attack a cell that's already infected. And so... You, they didn't have to do this to every papaya, 
But what they did was by doing this, they've essentially created a papaya plant that can't be infected or won't be infected. And they just use those papayas at herd immunity levels in papaya plantations. And so because of that, you know, you didn't have to have every papaya tree genetically engineered. I think it was like 70 or 80%. But by doing that, you know, the virus it spread so slowly that eventually it just kind of died off in its tracks. And nowadays we have delicious papayas to thank. And, you know, scientists continue doing that kind of work, which is quietly done in the background. And that's one of those things where I see it being a pretty responsible use of genetic engineering. And it's a huge success story. Amazing. Yeah, it's, it's super cool. <laughs> it's really cool I, to I'm... be in the labs. <laughs> I'm just uh, waiting for the uh, the plant version of Jurassic Park to come out. And uh, oh, no. <laughs> well, if you want to know about that, <laughs> this is wildly off topic. But one of the the things that's coming up with the Roundup Ready crops is it's inadvertently selecting for weeds that are also resistant to Roundup, and they call it, like I forget what it's a, it's like super weeds and like it's palmer's amaranth and other things so it's already happening and they're already you know figuring out workarounds and being like oh we have to go back to non-chemical means of weeding you know so it's not actually that big of a deal but yeah uh life uh finds a way <laughs> you included the um there which is really nice thank you you did the full quote properly <laughs> I, I will say too, for the Roundup resistant crops, like sorry, Roundup resistant um, weeds and whatnot. Weed? What's really cool about that is if you look at maps where you know you see countries, you know proportionally countries how much you know Roundup they use, and then also Roundup resistant weeds. You do see in countries where they don't use Roundup basically at all. There's almost no Roundup resistant weeds. And the yeah. thing is, if you stop using Roundup over time, the genes necessary to have Roundup resistance, because evolution is a use it or lose it kind mm -hmm. of thing, over time, they're going to lose that resistance. And then we can go back to just using Roundup if we want. Yeah, 100%. It's just so, it's just so funny to me, because I remember when they were first finding it, people were like, oh! And it's like, okay, no, it's it's not. It's not that bad. And it's especially amusing to me that, you know, the ones that don't have that gene when Roundup isn't present will outcompete the ones that do have it. So it's uh -huh. just fun. I, I like Space Butler's take on it. Life uh, finds a way. <laughs> you got to watch out. <laughs> All right. We'll, we'll move on to... Um, to hyperspheres next question i have a forest of dead ash trees from the uh the ash borer beater beetle what to do it's kind of dangerous they're they're all dead but standing uh it sounds like you might want to get them get them cut down and, <laughs> and Fashion, burn the, the yourself, beetle out <laughs> yeah I don't I don't have any advice on that just because the last thing I want to do is give someone advice on what my opinion is and then them getting yeah. killed by like a widowmaker tree because they tried chopping one oh, down. Oh yeah. And, yeah. So I'm I'm actually gonna just not say anything for this one. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm yeah, I think almost there, but one thing I would recommend is checking in with your local extension agency because that's not an issue I have here. But, like, they're going to know what you should do because there might be things with contamination and protocols and blah, blah, blah. That's rude. Uh, other things. So check with them. They might have a better idea because they are local to your area. And, I think, yeah, don't cut down trees unless you actually know what you're doing. Yeah, I think the only safe thing to do is to hire a professional licensed arborist to do this because people are killed by falling trees. Yeah. Yeah, it's actually, <laughs> my husband for a while was like, why don't you become an arborist? And I was like, because they have one of the highest mortality rates of any profession. So it is that. dangerous. Yeah, apparently I looked it up. I was like, okay, never mind. I am staying on the ground. <laughs> um, so check with your extension agency. And if they say, yeah, cut them down, then find yourself a certified arborist not 
just anyone, just find a certified arborist. If it makes you feel any better, we had some work done on trees. Uh, a couple were just shaped to remove some branches that were too low and just to give them a more pleasing appearance. And one tree was taken down completely. The tree that was taken down was cheaper to do than the shaping. Mm -hmm. So, oh, some yeah. good news there. <laughs> yeah. Taking down a tree is way easier than pruning it, it for health. That's precise. Yes. Well, except yeah, for you know, not yeah. getting killed thing. Yeah. <laughs> it really sucks, though, that you lost those ash trees because, man, like old yeah. ash trees look beautiful. There's a real problem uh, around uh, the the Midwest with with the the ash borer beetle, and there's there's uh, they if you detect those, uh, people urge you to just take out the tree before it spreads, basically. Oof. Yikes. So yeah, get a professional to to check that situation out. Uh. So the uh, the next question from Hypersphere is is Space Butler locked in the basement? So I think I can uh, I can cover this one. Uh, there is actually no lock on the basement door, but I am assured by IG that as soon as the podcast is over, that the traps will be disabled and I will be allowed back upstairs. So you don't have to worry word. about that. I will keep my word. I promise. You can't see it, but he's blinking in Morse code. Help me. <laughs> I really can't see it because I'm upstairs and not because of the traps on the stairs, but. Uh, this is an audio only podcast, so uh, the any messages would uh, through video would be pretty difficult to. Wellness to, checks uh, afterward are appreciated. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, moving on. Uh, Beer Bear asks. Is there anything I can do to amend, uh, can amend my soil with to prevent nutrient leaching because of heavy rain? So, you can increase your soil organic matter in general because it creates more bonding sites. But also, I was looking this up, and one of the things that actually has research behind it, and a lot of people in the agricultural arena do, is they will plant a cover crop for over the winter because then the plant is taking up those nutrients so they're not just loose around water getting uh, washed away. Um, so planting a cover crop that you plant in fall, it goes to the winter and then you cut down when it's time to do your spring planting is a, a solution for that. Bears in zone 13. <laughs> Say what? I believe Bear is in zone 13, so oh. she does not have a winter. Well, then just keep <laughs> growing year-round. Just, just keep growing year-round. Keep, um, if you're not already doing a, they call it a living mulch when it's a cover crop that's during the same time as your main crop. So, like, an example for my zone would be growing clover in between your apple trees. I have no idea what the equivalent would be in zone 13 but some non-competing cover crop, uh, mm -hmm. living mulch sort of thing might be something to look into. I was imagining, you know, the cold rain that we have here, where it's like during the gra growing season, we get barely anything, and then when everything's dormant, it just pours. Um, so zone 13 is a completely different ball of wax. Yep. One thing to remember, though, which is is important for rainfall, is it really does depend on like the type of rainfall. Mm -hmm. If it's like if it's like a very sudden, very hard downpour, it will cause nutrient leaching. But then the thing is, if it's just like you know those like sprinklings or like a fairly kind of consistent raining, what rain typically does do is the water, so the nucleus of a water droplet will be you know dust or anything like that, which holds nutrients for plants. Mm -hmm. And as it falls down to the earth, it can contain things like nitrates and phosphates, which are the most biologically available, so bioavailable form of nitrogen, nitrates, and so. I mean, it it can act as like a small balancing act. It's not a ton of nutrients. It's obviously not the same as if you just yeah. did a hit of fertilizer, but it's not like rain doesn't bring nothing to the table too. So that is kind of also a, a thing. Good news. Yeah. 
All right. Velociraptor asks, what are some important things to keep in mind to improve success in gardening in pots? When a you're general, gardening... general question. Yeah. Um, I think the thing to keep in mind, especially if you're coming from growing in soil, is that once you put it in a pot, you are like way more responsible for it getting the water and nutrients it needs because it can't escape that pot uh, unless you put it on the soil and it pulls a <laughs> escape. Um, because a lot of times, you know, in our yards, we have a lot more flexibility because the plants can send out these huge root systems and they have those mycorrhizae networks and that's pulling in moisture and nutrients from all around. And when you're in a dinky little pot, <laughs> you don't have that. And then the other thing I would say is learn how to water well, um, because I feel like a lot of people's struggle with houseplants comes down to watering and knowing when to water and how deeply to water. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure there's lots of opinions on that. But my favorite is to water from the bottom. So put your pot in a container of water and let it soak up a good amount of water. Like, you know, let it sit there for, you know, five minutes maybe for succulents, longer for other things, and then let it drain and then move it back to its normal spot. I would not do that with pot ops though. So, you know, it's all about finding out what that particular species needs in that pot condition. And obviously to have a drainage hole on the bottom. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hundred percent. And there's factors like having to fertilize because you're not you're just using up the yeah. fertilizer yeah. or uh, compost like or whatever. Sometimes people forget about that because I have seen multiple people who were like, my plant is not doing anything. It hasn't done anything for two months and it's summer. Mm -hmm. Why isn't it doing anything? I'm watering it. And it's like, okay, uh, when was the last time you added fertility? And they're like, what? Because they haven't, right? So just remember that you're responsible for water and fertility. And also if they're outside, Plants and pots are more vulnerable to temperature swings. So keep that in mind, too. Cassie, anything to add? No, no, no not really. You basically covered all of it. <laughs> okay. Exotic asks, how to prevent pests and disease, if that's even possible? So what are, what are your tips to uh, maybe reduce the amount of pests and disease in your plants? Cassie, you want to go first? Uh, I just recently put a plant of mine out on the balcony. And if in case you guys are wondering, it is January, right? And I <laughs> live in the cold. And so the balcony is the kill zone. Um, I don't expect uh -huh. that plant to survive because it was covered in some spider mites of some variety, some species of. Uh -huh. So I might the not worst. be the best person to talk to about okay. pests. So. <laughs> I will take over. <laughs> um, so most of my background is in outdoor gardening. So there's a lot you can do. Um, the first thing is, is that just like a healthy person who's getting enough sleep, eating good, nutritious food, exercising, doesn't have much stress, is less likely to get sick. It's not 100%, but they're less likely to get sick. A plant that is in appropriate conditions is also less likely to get attacked by pests, okay? So that's the first thing. Like, I have plants that never get any pests in my house, even if they're right next to something that's a pest magnet, because they're better suited for my conditions, okay? Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, I have there's one species of succulent that I just can't keep the woolly bugs off of, right? Because it doesn't like my conditions. I don't have enough light for it. It's not quite warm enough for it. So it's just always in a slightly weakened state. 
The other thing is, is especially for outdoor, and I've seen people who run market gardens and small farms in greenhouses using beneficial insects. And I'm not talking about pollinators here because that's often where people's minds go first, but things like ladybugs and lace wings, you can attract those or purchase them and uh, put the plants that they need around the plants that you're growing. And they will actually, you know, eat the things that are trying to eat your plants. Um, and they have done studies on it, and it's really cool because, you know, I, I forget which plant it was. It was lettuce, and I think it was a alyssum, like sweet alyssum. They interplanted, and in an organic farm setting at a commercial scale, it was worthwhile because they attracted the predators of, I believe it was aphids, and they ate the aphids, so the lettuce crop didn't have that problem and awesome. yeah and i know some i haven't seen any research to back this up yet let me say that first but i know some people who are into more expensive hard to find house plants are starting to go out and get beneficial insects to bring into their house and i'm just a little like oh, i'm not sure about whether that's a good idea yeah but, <laughs> Right? It's like, oh, are you sure you want to do that? Um, and then for a house plant, one of the big problems people run into a lot is fungus gnats, right? Like, yeah, I don't know about over there, but like basically in Wash Western Washington State, like a year or two ago, it was like literally everyone was like, I have fungus gnats that came from nowhere. I you know, and they were just huge wave. And so what works really well for those is BT, and the easiest way to do it is get those little mosquito dunks because that has the BT that works on mosquitoes and also fungus gnats, and put one of those little discs in your watering can and let it just soak, and then water your plants with that, and that will, in my experience, take care of the infestation. So, you know. And also the little yellow sticky papers, they're fantastic to reduce the population numbers. Yeah, yeah, and so I like good. to use those. <laughs> so easy. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm. I just find them a little too gross. <laughs> but oh, yeah, really? they definitely just, work. Yeah. I know it's yeah. it's funny what I find gross because there's definitely things that I don't find gross that other people do, and then there's that I'm like, Ugh. I mean, I'm not exactly a bug lover, so <laughs> I get you. <laughs> right. <laughs> but also, as not a bug lover, this might be a bit ironic, but something I've learned this past year, the one of the best ways to have less pests is to grow more plants, which I, I love this because, you know, more plants, who doesn't love that? And I'm talking about outdoors because you will attract okay. more types of insects with having more right. biodiversity, and you yes. basically create an ecosystem and they'll... Kind of start yes. taking care of each other. Yeah. It, oh, my God. Yes. Uh, so <laughs> one of the things that comes up a lot is companion planting. And one of the things I wish people would get pointed towards more when they start searching for that stuff is insectiary plants, which are those plants that pull in all those beneficial insects. And then if you have an ecosystem full of predators that are ready to eat your aphids, that's great. But then, of course, you also have to be uh, aware that when you spray a broad spectrum pesticide, your predator species, generally speaking, reproduce at a much slower rate than your uh, sap suckers and aphids and all the annoying things. So you might knock down the aphid population, but you've wiped out the, you know, lace wings or whatever. And the aphids are going to bounce back much more quickly than the lace wings. So just keep that in mind. But yeah, look into biodiversity and creating habitat for all sorts of insects and plant native plants. <laughs> it's actually funny that you, you brought that up that their predators die back because if I remember correctly, it was in a population ecology course I was in, uh, we were actually reading up on a case study where 
the first insecticides that were used in America were used to treat, uh, I think it's cottony spider mites. And yeah, they found exactly that where they were, they were using it and it killed off a lot of these pest insects, which was awesome. But then they also found that the populations of the predatory insects that could mm -hmm. eat these, you know, they were almost wiped out. And then lo and behold, the the spider mites bounced back and the resulting, you know, next wave of or population of them was actually more devastating than the first one. And so, especially with, you know, insecticides, you really have to either kill them all, uh, which I tried to do with my mite problem, or you're yeah. going to just suffer from the fact that, you know, they're going to bounce back. Yep. Yep. As a, a, to allude to a previous earlier quote, uh, life uh, finds a way, and that also applies to pesticides. <laughs> Yep. Uh, so now we need the uh, the insect version of Jurassic Park as well. So oh no, we'll we don't. We really don't. <laughs> <laughs> no. All right. <laughs> oh. I know what that sound means. It's Don't. riddle time. I've written oh. some riddles that Space Butler is going to read out. And our audience is going to try to puzzle them out in event chat. Oh, Bubs, thank you. She says, favorite time. <laughs> and if you guys need help, we'll turn to our panel of experts, Passy and Zappy. So here we go. First riddle. The virtue of patience you must embrace to master this art form of planting in trays. Oh, <laughs> before I even had a chance to paste the question, everybody got the answer. It is bonsai. Yeah, apparently, apparently bonsai means planting in trays for some reason. I did not know this. Bubs is using cheat code, so what a serious uh -huh. accusation. Oh, no. Okay. Well, let's move on to the next riddle. My fingers are yellow, but my name isn't Bart. I'm the generous sort, so my hands come from the heart. Nope, not Buddha's hand. Actually, I don't know what Buddha's hand is. What is that? Oh, I know what Buddha's hand is. That's a what good guess, actually. I like that one. Buddha's hand is, if I remember correctly, it's a fruit that is grown en masse in around the Pacific Asia region. I know that it's used a lot in, I want to say, what oh. festival is it now? Rose got it first. Sorry. Sorry, Passy. The correct answer is banana. Mm. But go ahead, Passy. Oh, no, no, it's just an aside. It is. It's, <laughs> okay. it's a really neat, weird-looking one. Definitely should look it up. <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely. Sounds interesting. Next riddle. My toxin is clever. It kills pests in their spawn, except for the human who consumes it at dawn. Haha. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Pika got it. <laughs> yes, piping. coffee. Coffee, indeed. Correct. It's delicious. A very delicious uh, toxin. toxin. <laughs> uh, humans, humans tend to humans tend to drink a lot of toxins uh, eat, for fun. And eat them too, like yes. peppers. We're super creative when it comes to that. <laughs> yep. All right, next riddle. Yeah. I grow in the sand and can poke out an eye. My syrup is sweet. I'm American as pie. Oh, bear. Oh, my God. I think these are too easy. You guys are. <laughs> <laughs> it is agave. <laughs> yeah, agave. That almost bef like, I think if you were like, maybe 10 seconds slower at posting the riddle 
<laughs> Logger Bear would have actually had posted the answer before then. <laughs> I've I've never actually had agave nectar. Um, have 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 you? It's Anybody nothing to write home about. As a Canadian, I'm just going to endorse maple syrup. <laughs> oh well, maple syrup I'm is is terrific. Legal, I'm legally yeah. required to endorse maple syrup. Oh yeah. If if there's a pancake or a waffle, I want maple syrup on it. No oh. question. Oh, yes. All right, next next riddle here. Eaten for lunch by Victorians prized, fermented to drink in the burbs were despised. Uh, let's see if this this question lasts for more There's than typing. five seconds. Nick is typing. <laughs> before it's answered. I think this one's trickier. It must be trickier. There's no there's not yeah. even a, a guess yet. <laughs> We're just throwing things out there now. And the burbs were despised. Cucumbers? <laughs> Cross is not the correct answer, but it is very creative. Huh. I feel uh, like we... There's a couple people here that should get this really quickly. Uh, there's uh not yet. Should we uh should we turn to the panel on this one? What say you panel? I was going to guess cucumbers and pickle juice? Nope. Dang. Oh, oh wait. Oh shoot. Is it fermented to drink? Is it rhubarb? You guys want a clue? Yeah, yeah, a clue yeah would give, give a clue. <laughs> okay, so the clue is that this drink is wine. Someone already said grapes. A wine or oh yeah, I think so. did somebody say wine? It's it's not grapes, but you can make a wine out of it. Oh. Honey? Somebody said raisins. That's not the correct. Answer. Yeah, honey mead. Love mead. It's not cider, is it? No, that's not right. Nobody liked eating apples until recently. So surprised. Well, they this weren't very the good until recently. Yeah, apples used to suck. It's <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> true. It is so true. The heritage varieties of apples are just not, bad. they're not good. They're <laughs> the just only thing bad. they're good for is making cider. <laughs> uh, well, I don't know. Uh, another it looks clue? Like, Time for another uh, clue? I think so, yeah. Okay, it, it's something quite humble and pedestrian. That is kind of looked down upon. These days. Yeah, this one's surprisingly tricky. Yeah. Okay, another clue. It is very divisive on our server. Like, we've had serious arguments about this. Uh, People are typing. Pineapples? Grass no. herbicides, nice. <laughs> <laughs> Fermented herbicides, probably not. Mm, uh, not what you want. That sounds like a bad idea. Not grass bubs, but you're so close. Dandelions, Evie got it. Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh. oh. Uh, yes, dandelions. <laughs> yeah. I have not tried dandelion wine. I am curious. Dandelion wine. Ooh. A friend of mine, like, made a nectar thingy by picking the flowers and putting in a simple syrup and cooking that down, and that tasted pretty good, but I feel like that's because there was a lot of sugar in there. Um, sugar, yeah. Dandelions? I'm not gonna lie. Uh -huh. They're a little bit, they're a little bit of a weird 
a weird plant when it comes to uh to botany stuff. There's like like people who study dandelions, they're called taraxicologists because oh, wow. taraxicum is the genus, and that's a super cool name. Um, but then the thing is, they love fighting a lot. Oh, um, so there's there's a lot of debate in the taraxicology world, which is again a cool name, um, between even how many species of dandelion there are, where a lot of people are saying there's sixty. Or around 60. What? And then there's some people who are saying, no, there's like as much as 2,000 species oh, of dandelions. Oh, wow. Yeah, I apparently which need to fun. learn more about dandelions. Are then I thought there was just like yellow magic? and pink. Oh, man. And it, it keeps going, too. There's so many fun things about dandelions. Oh. Like... <laughs> They, are, they reproduce by apomixis, which is a, a botanical way of saying to go F yourself, uh, which is great. <laughs> yeah, I can keep going to be near the lines, but I'm going to stop because that's nerdy and lame. We'll have the, uh, the, the all dandelion episode of the, uh, the podcast later. <laughs> but we'll move that. on. Oh. We'll mo move on to the next <laughs> riddle now. Uh, Marquise in the Garden. Plants and marquees, knights, dames, and royals in the spring breeze. See if chat can get this one. No, not cheese. <laughs> uh, Jesus, I don't even. I don't even understand. Uh, this is not. Uh, it, uh, well, I like I you think... thinking outside the box, though, because uh, this. Uh, the answer to this question is not. It's not a plant. A plant, yes. Oh, well, then I'm out of the running. <laughs> <laughs> it's gardening related, but it's not a plant. I think I think they're gonna need a hint. I need a hint. <laughs> okay. Um it is an annual event. I think that's a good hint. Yeah. Christmas? All right, you guys, talk this out. Stay there, unfortunately. Actually, I don't know when your birthday is. I mean, it does say spring breeze. That's a clue. Not the cherry blossoms in D.C. Literal when I say night stains and... Oh, sorry, well. I have caps lock on by accident. <laughs> I'm not that enthusiastic about that. There we go. Nope, not spring showers, not Renaissance fair. It is gardening related. It is gardening related. El Nino. That's a good one. It's a gardening related event that is in the spring that has a distinguished uh, guest of the royal variety. I don't oh. Know. oh, shoot. <laughs> I don't oh, think the they're going to get it. No. They're not going to get it. They're not going to get it, are they? Yeah, I don't, I don't think so. I, Can I keep giving clues or are we, we ready to... No, no, uh, reveal, reveal the answer. Okay. We don't have a drum roll uh, sound effect, do we, unfortunately? I, no, no, I don't have that queued up, sorry. <laughs> All right. All right. Oh, there we go. 
the emoji works. It is the Chelsea Flower Show. Huh. It is held uh, in sort of the garden area of the Chelsea Hospital, which is uh, a veteran pensioner's home. Yeah. And the tents set up there are called marquees, and vendors show off their plants in those marquees. Huh. Well, I've heard of that thing. Isn't that done by, like, the Royal Horticultural Society or it one is, of the yes. giant gardens in yes, Britain? Yes, it is. Oh, yeah, I would have never gotten that. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, moving on to uh, to the last riddle here. My bulging physique is growing unseen, and just like the Hulk, I'm trouble when green. Ooh. It's potato. <laughs> we go from super hard to potato. <laughs> potato. We like the potato. Everybody likes the potato. I love potatoes. Potatoes, potatoes do not eat. You don't eat it if it turns green. D don't that eat the correct. green potatoes. Yes. Uh, a little bit of green is okay, I hear, but uh, if you eat a lot of green potatoes, you can get serious stomach upset. You can also just cut off the green part and eat the rest of the potato. Sure. Wasn't sure. there an Arthur episode about that? Am I, am I the only that, one? What's the cartoon? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I think I'm the only one who knows maybe. Uh, is it about green potato chips? Yes, that's the one. Yeah, there oh. it is. Well, that's uh, <laughs> I'm not the only one who remembers that. Nice. Yeah, I think uh, for green potato chips, it probably is not enough, um, not enough of the toxin to really hurt you. But the yeah, green potato chips not. don't, yeah, don't taste very good. So, yeah, because the toxin's bitter anyway. So, yeah, don't get it. Okay, so the uh, potato, uh, who who won that one? The the first potato potato identifier. Once again, <laughs> once again, bear. I was going to say once again, potato. Well, it is once again, uh, potato. They're the heroes of this a, episode. Once again, potato. Yes, indeed. So that's uh, that's the last riddle. So we've reached the end of the episode here. Um, IG, you want to take us out? Thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in. And thank you, Passy and Zappy, for your insights and your time. You are superstars. Oh, thank you. And thank remember, you. life uh, finds a way. <laughs>